And if there was a suspicion of foul play, or if there is something where the data is, is, is there's questions around the data, you can see from, from point A to point B to the final archive version, um, what data was collected, how it was validated. And perhaps that may lead to uh, invest further investigation, or it simply allows people to trust but verify that the data that's being used as input of smart contracts don't have to take the protocol's word for it, don't have to take the DAP's word for it, don't even have to take OrgFact's word for it. You can study and verify the audit logs yourself. What is going on, Ada Nation? Welcome to DAP Central. My name is Farid, and as a part of today's video, I'm going to be joined by Peter Van Garderen, who's going to be the CEO and founder of the OrxFact protocol, which is going to be an Oracle platform building on Cardano. Peter, welcome to the channel. How are you doing? Super. Thanks a lot for having me on. You are completely welcome. Now, OrgFax has been making a lot of waves. You guys recently just launched on the mainnet. And as a part of today's video, we're going to be touching on that and everything else that the OrgFax protocol has to offer. So before we jump into everything, I want to give the viewers a quick overview of what we're going to be chatting about, which includes a brief introduction and a little bit of your background to start things off. Following that, we're going to talk about your mainnet release and just the developmental progress that has taken place all along the way. Following that, I want to highlight some potential partnerships or integrations that may be on the radar, followed by a brief discussion surrounding the FACT token, its utility, and your tokenomics. Now, last but not least, I want to get your closing thoughts and just your vision when it comes to the future of OrgFact. So that said, let's go ahead and jump right on in again. I want to thank you for your time on this wonderful evening. Do you mind kicking us off with a brief introduction as to your background and giving us a brief overview of what OrgFact is? You bet. Um, so I myself uh, consider myself an archivist. I have a graduate degree in archival science. As archivists have been around for centuries, we manage collections of historical documents and make sure that they're preserved and remain accessible and usable over time. And then as society switched to digital information, us archivists began to specialize in preserving digital information, data that's maintained in you know, databases and document collections, email systems. Um, all of these things are records of uh, business records, government records, societal records, personal records. Um, and so we have now developed expertise as archivists, uh, developed systems, protocols, uh, standards, technology to figure out how to keep digital information maintainable, usable, authentic and accurate over time across generations of technology. So that's an area of expertise we call digital preservation. And in that particular field, we're very concerned around information authenticity and accuracy. So if you can imagine, you know, bringing up, a, uh, creating a document today, a PDF format, what have you, Google Doc, and then 20, 30 years from now, needing that record for whatever, for, for a business record, for historical reasons, for financial reasons, um, you can imagine that that data has probably been migrated over several generations of technology, has been reformatted to keep it usable on whatever form of information technology we're using at 30 years in the future. You can only imagine whatever interfaces and storage devices we might be using at that point. But the point is that the record itself, the information hasn't changed. And so how can you prove the actual content, the context of that information, its meaning is still a record. So we spent a lot of time thinking about um, that, that problem. It's a very large, uh, complicated problem and has a lot of angles to it. And so we developed, but over time we've developed this expertise. And so I became very interested early on in blockchain technology because blockchain talks a lot about this idea of like data authenticity and, and trustless networks. And so I became fascinated with uh, the technology itself, its potential. I, be I began tinkering and, and doing a lot of uh, research in this area. And then as an archivist, I was very much drawn to this thing called the Oracle problem, which is like, how can we take external data from the real world and introduce it into these trustless networks as reliable input data for things like smart contracts? For example, like a DeFi contract might have a stop loss order that says, when the price of ADA hits this much USD, I want you to sell my holdings. And that external data has to come from somewhere. And ideally, that comes from a trustless decentralized Oracle feed like OrgFax. Um, but it, it, depending on the project or the protocol, it may not be using such a type of Oracle feed. Um, but that's the ideal scenario in a DeFi, uh, in, a, in a DeFi archive, make sure everything is as decentralized as possible, including where you're getting ex your external data from. So as an archivist, I, I start to analyze the Oracle problem because I think it's a bit of a weak link in the entire DeFi puzzle. I'm also very much consider myself like a blockchain evangelist, a decentralization evangelist. I believe very much in decentralization as a movement for, for good that is going to allow society to reorganize how it manages itself, how it manages its resources. And so I, I very much believe in, I still am very much a true believer in this vision of decentralization. And um, that's a larger discussion of, you know, why I'm also involved in the Cardano space and why I've chosen to build on Cardano 
um because i believe it's 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 the right home for this for these kind of this kind of community um so i very much wanted to see a oracle that really tackled the oracle problem in a reliable way and allowed um allow DeFi to fulfill the potential of decentralization technology because we can talk a little bit more about some of the architecture decisions that we've made in our design and what how we're trying to address the local problem but i still think there's a lot of gaps in that particular problem space and so as an archivist that's very much interested in documentation and the authenticity of information of ensuring the integrity of systems um, I decided to throw my hat in the ring um, and put in uh, a Project Catalyst proposal for a, a, a better type of decentralized Oracle on Cardano. It, it got funded um, once Vassal, uh, the, the Vassal hard fork kicked in and made it um, actually feasible for us to do decentralized Oracles on Cardano. So ever since then, we've been heavy in heavy R&D mode and have come out with uh, something we call the Cardano Open Oracle Protocol, which is really the, the protocol and rules for how we publish data on chain as a, as a Cardano based Oracle. And yeah, that's... That's where, that's how the journey started, and that's how we're why we're here today now talking about uh, now, uh, unfortunately, our main net launch and, and and how we're gonna go move ahead with this project. Thank you, Peter. Just listening to you speak, I can hear the expertise in the preciseness of how you 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 talk about it. To me, it sounds like you were already doing a lot of this data preservation before you came into blockchain. And it sounds like blockchain basically complemented what you're already doing professionally. And so for somebody who, for example, is just not familiar with an Oracle, right? On your guys' website, you guys have a really neat graphic that I want to pull up here that basically breaks down, you know, the process from beginning to end. Do you mind touching on how the data, which is coming from the real world or just coming from real world events, goes from the outside, right, off chain, all the way to the end where it's now verified and available for other providers or people that want to leverage that data on chain? Yeah, you bet. Thanks, and thanks for bringing this graphic up. If you can, you scroll a little bit to the left. You might see the, um, um, you can see the diagram starts a little bit further to the left. But this idea that um, you know, first of all, like oracles, what what is an oracle doing? It's reporting on things that are happening in the real world, um, and so we are very um, we used a, a, um, a methodology called domain driven design. So we we define the domain that this oracle operates in, and the real world is a is a four dimensional grid of space and time if you um, and anything that happens in that four dimensional grid is an event and oracles report on those events and the most common event we're used to oracles reporting on in the DeFi space today the most the thing that's easiest to understand is this idea of changes in 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 currency price pairs so the real world events that's happening on the real world is that people right now as we speak are buying ada for usd and they're selling their ADA for USD. And those, those individual events all enter order books on centralized exchanges like Kraken and Binance and KuCoin. And they take that data and derive their own uh, their own averages from the sales as they're happening per some, some cases per second. And they report those freely in, in their APIs. So th those are real world events, people buying and selling ADA. And what that means is we arrive at a data point, which is a mean average that we as we go and collect as an Oracle and report on chain. Now, how oracles go about collecting the data is something that we're very passionate about, this idea that we should be triangulating all our data collection. This idea that if you as an oracle are taking data from a single source, a single trusted source, and simply repackaging and reformatting and publishing it back on chain, that data may still have questions around its authenticity and accuracy because it came from a single source. If the same data is reported by multiple sources, at least three or more, and then that data can be checked against each other. Now you're fulfilling a triangulation principle where if there's an anomaly or an outlier in any of the data that's being collected, it should trigger some kind of alarm bells or at least a closer look to see if there's any kind of uh, foul play or if the data is in fact still authentic or accurate. So that's what we mean by triangulated data collection. And so in the case of um, in collecting information about currency price pairs, it's as simple as hitting at least three centralized exchanges, like I said, like Kraken, KuCoin, and Binance, Coin, and so forth that provide that information uh, at, a, at a regularly scheduled interval and the other but then you can imagine other kinds of real world events and that are happening out there that could be of interest to a smart contract or a decentralized app living on a blockchain a really common example is sporting events so you would have a gambling app or let's say a fantasy football league that's being run um, on the blockchain and we're starting to see those apps and we're starting to talk to some people in the kind of community that are interested in producing those apps um, and so there again, you have a real world event. What's the final score in this football match? Manchester United three, Chelsea two. That if that data can now become an inch, can become a data input into a smart contract that's sitting on chain waiting for this outside information. And again, 
betting apps and fantasy leagues being run on a, on a decentralized blockchain can be more trustworthy because the actual flow of information can, is coming from decentralized um, uh, Oracle feeds and the actual smart contract logic is deterministic, meaning it's, it's always going to execute exactly the same way. It, once it's on chain, it can't be hacked. And so it provides a more secure, transparent betting, betting a fantasy league type platform for sporting events. Other kinds of products that an Oracle or kind of uh, data that Oracles might report on would be to feed other kinds of products like uh, insurance uh, products. So we're seeing like extreme weather event insurance, for example, where if you are a farmer and you have a, a, a policy on extreme weather events in this particular geographic location, and you can verify that there was an extreme weather event like a flood within that particular your polygon of of your your your, your policy lives within the same polygon of this extreme weather event, and that can immediately trigger out a uh, an insurance claim because there's a deterministic smart contract sitting on chain going, has there been a flood? Yes or no? Or has there been this kind of temperature? Whatever whatever kind of data you're tracking, and there there is those kind of products already exist outside of the Cardano blockchain and other blockchains. And then it goes way beyond that, though, because I think over the long run, what we're going to see is the need for real world fact verification in our ever changing, fast moving world that's being driven by a lot of AI systems and this AI revolution that we're about to enter. And so we're going to have more and more questions in our daily lives, whether it's in business or governance or what have you about whether information is fact real or not, whether it's being generated by AI, whether it's human generated, whether it's a deep fake, whether it's disinformation. So to have a, a decentralized fact gathering collecting system that's backed by a civil resistant blockchain technology that can't easily be hacked, whether it's by humans or by AI gener generated agents um, is gonna be a real powerful tool in society going forward, I think for us humans to kind of continue, continue to make a grasp of what the real world actually is. So I see this really long-term vision for what oracles can, uh, the type of data they will collect. Um, but in each case, for the OrcFax project, we will sit down and go, depending on the type of data, can we triangulate the source? If so, then we have th at least three or more uh, just data sources that we collect the data from. And then the next step in that diagram is talking about stake-based info validation. So there'll be multiple sources to collect data from, and we will use multiple collectors to collect the data from multiple sources. So now we have multiple collectors collecting from multiple sources and reformatting the data, normalizing it, and then checking against the data that the others have collected. And now we can have even more, um, uh, uh, more vectors where we can say, if there's an outlier, it's going to be more obvious in a network. And then the greater the node network, the larger the number of validator nodes we have, the more and more stable that the actual data collection and data veracity checking is going to be. And that's going to be run by an independent pool of uh, validator node operators, similar to the stake pool operator network that we're familiar with in the Cardano space. And so a node operator would um, use some of our utility token called the FACT token to stake um, as a node operator so that they can participate as a good citizen. And if their node ever misbehaves, reports false data, or is somehow not performing well uh, network-wise, it may have their stake slashed as as a punishment and also as an incentive, of course, to be a good citizen in, in the node operator pool. And this is a very common design we see in all kinds of validator pool networks across the blockchain space. And so that's the idea of stake-based validation. And then those same node operators will be rewarded in the utility token for publishing facts, for collecting, validating, and publishing them to the blockchain. And that's the validation step. Then the actual Cardano Open Oracle protocol kicks in. This, I, these rules and protocol we've written for what's the most efficient, cost-efficient way um, easiest way to take off-chain data, but still verify it as authentic, verify that it came from a certified uh, publishing source and put that on chain. And that's what the Cardano Open Oracle Protocol gives us. We worked for quite a few months with M Labs. We're still uh, getting, we're still working together on refining the protocol. Um, so we spent a long time just analyzing how can we make a, a cost-effective, um, uh, efficient, uh, developer-friendly protocol for consuming data on chain using the Cardano EUXTO model. So as we all know, the extended UTXO model, sorry, as we all know, all the people in the Cardano space know, our system is extra special because it's extended UTXO model. It gives it a lot of security guarantees. It gives it a lot of reliability, stability guarantees. It also is, is not as simple to produce and share data as it is on global state chains like Ethereum and EVM. So we've, we've, we think we've had provided a very elegant, um, unique solution to this problem. 
And so we've open sourced it. It's been open sourced on the Apache 2 license for a number of months already. That means other projects can, that if they want to introduce their own Oracle, they can use the same protocol, or you can study how we are actually um, putting data on chain. And so then the next step then is, yeah, is actually take that datum and package it in Cardano's uh, um, concise uh, binary object representation format um, and put that on chain in a, in a blockchain, in a Cardano blockchain transaction. And then uh, Cardano smart contracts can use that as, as, as they're called reference inputs into the, the they can spend those EOTXOs um, and then they can use that to trigger this, the, the kind of uh, smart contract logic we were talking about earlier. And on top of all of that, um, once that's done, um, we feel another real serious weak point in solving the Oracle problem is simply traceability around this whole data flow. Like, where did you get the data from? How was, what, you know, can you give us some audit information about how that data was checked and verified? Can we trace it back to how it was published? Um, and can we, can we look at that data? Can we study that data? So what we're doing as part of the OrgFax uh, platform is that um, we are creating uh, archival standard compliant packages of the entire flow of data as, as we collect it, validate it, publish it, and putting in these standards compliant archival packages on a other de a decentralized storage network. Uh, so that data is also decentralized. It's permi there's permissionless access to all the auto logs that we generate. This particular one, uh, data decentralized storage network is called Arweave. It's become quite popular in the last few years in, in the Web3 space. It's a very similar idea to IPFS and Filecoin, where this, it's its own decentralized storage network. It's a permission, permissionless storage network. Um, some unique things about it that we really like is this idea that it has an endowment model. So you pay once for the storage and the, the system, the network's incentivized to keep those online for in this current case, according to the algorithm, 200 years. Um, so it provides a, some additional um, sustainability guarantees. Uh, but the long and short of it is that you can uh, go directly to Arweave. You can open up any auto log package for, and trace it back to any datum that was published by the OrcFax uh, Oracle network. And if there was suspicion of foul play, or if there is something where the data is, is, is there's questions around the data, you can see from, from point A to point B to the final archive version, um, what data was collected, how it was validated. And perhaps that may lead to uh, invest further investigation, or it simply allows people to trust but verify that the data that's being used as input of smart contracts don't have to take the protocol's word for it, don't have to take the DAP's word for it, don't even have to take OrgFax's word for it. You can study and verify the audit logs yourself to create, to kind of close this loop. Um, and we talk about blockchains being trustless, um, meaning that but trustless and trustworthy are really two sides of the same coin. If 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 the block if we consider Cardano to be trustless, it's because we really trust the technology. We trust the model and design of the blockchain L1 technology. We trust the EU takes own model. And so we are trusting something. It's, and but the idea is that the network itself is trustless because of, we trust that design. We know that as data is getting path, passed from one node to the other, as 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 transactions are being packages, packaged, that data is, has high veracity guarantees because of the design of the network. And we trust that design. But the data coming from the external world needs to be trustworthy. And trustworthy means authentic and accurate. Like we need authentic and accurate data to hit our trustless network so they can remain trustless. And so that's the, that's the you know the, the number of steps that we've taken in the OrgFax design to hopefully improve upon that Oracle problem and try to improve the, the quality of, of Oracle products, not just in Cardano, but across the space as a whole. What a clear and concise explanation again your expertise is really showing and i'm learning along the way you know um, as a content creator releasing videos about these platforms it's always best to i personally think hear it directly from the creators of the platform i think you do a really good job of breaking things down again thank you for that step-by-step -step breakdown just to recap some things that stood out to me the biggest was probably the fact that you guys are aiming to be open sourced, right? In this particular ecosystem, especially within Cardano, right? I think there's a huge push for everybody to do things in an open source manner. That way, number one, everything is transparent. The community can double check. But the number two, anybody coming behind you guys doesn't have to rebuild the wheel. So I think right. that will actually pay dividends in the future as more and more people come on and say, hey, you know, we're building another platform, but we're able to leverage some of the code that was built by a platform like OrgFax, especially as you guys are able to be funded through Project Catalyst. So again, I wanted to say thank you for that. Second thing that stood out to me was your emphasis on redundancy when it comes to data gathering, as well as your emphasis on data security. So the early stage where you said that you have multiple data points, right, with the triangulation, but then different 
platforms that are picking those data points is, I think, really interesting. And then just very uh, lastly that you just mentioned was the archive audit trails, right? So if anybody has any doubts or suspicion about the validity of the data, they can actually go back and verify that on their own without having to reach out to a third party. Now, you're in the Cardano ecosystem. I'm not sure if you're keeping up with it, but we saw Cerberus release some pretty in-depth details surrounding some investigations, right? So I think that for me was a turning point where I realized like the ability to fact check and to analyze these things mm. is something that needs to be widely available to the public. And so for, so to the fact that you guys have already thought about that, I think, again, is is a bonus in my book because inevitably, right, if, for example, you mentioned like a, a betting application taking some of this data, if somebody feels wronged about their bet, right, they're going to yeah. want to go back and double check that the data was correct. If somebody, you know, believes that the data is is dirty coming in, they're going to want to be able to verify that. So right. I think having something like the archive audit, audit trails um, is going to be key. And I was really happy to see that there um, as a part of the architecture. Again, Peter, such a great explanation. Let's keep things moving along. The biggest highlight here is going to be the fact that you guys just launched on the main net. Now, this took place just a couple of days ago. Do you mind touching on why this is so important and what it really took to get to this point now? Um, yeah, we ran. So the very first feed that we're offering is uh, the ADA USD price feed. So like what is the current price of ADA in USD dollars or the vice versa? And um, that's a very commonly used data point in a, across a lot of uh, Cardano DeFi products. So that's a good one to start with. Uh, we are offering it for free, meaning that nobody has to pay to use it to get first publishing access to it. Uh, everybody gets equal access to it, that datum as it is produced uh, once per hour. Um, and um, that is the first of several feeds that we will start offering um, from the OrcFax Oracle service. Uh, it, again, it's the most obvious one to start with. It's the most widely used type of feed in, the, in, in our ecosystem. Um, and uh, it really, yeah, it really allows us to then adapt uh, that entire architecture stack to collecting other types of data and publishing on chain. So getting it that final, you know, I don't know if in engineering, we always talk about getting to that last 20% or last 20% always, you know, drags on forever and ever. And our, ours was no different. It, we were on pre-prod for quite a while. And as we started moving our uh, architecture over to mainnet, there was still some uh, piece, piece of the puzzle that we had to get rolling. So. When we finally arrived at mainnet launch, we were quite excited about it. And uh, I, yeah, that was last week. Um, we have a, a Pi Cardano tutorial that allows uh, developers very easily to like just have a go at our at that, at that feed and see what it, what the data looks like on chain and how they can retrieve it and use it off chain. Um, and uh, yeah, we're now we're in negotiations and discussions with uh, a variety of different developers that are looking to perhaps use that data feed or want to see other types of data feeds introduced for their products or dApps. And um, the other, the, the main thing now though is also to start trying to raise a little bit of awareness in the community around the need for decentralized Oracle feeds. Like there, you know, Charlie Three is named our only competitor in the Cardano space, the only other or fact, oh, sorry, the only other Oracle service in the Cardano space. Um, and they've had a ADA USD feed up for quite a while as well. And I think the challenge now is for both of our projects to convince the Cardano DeFi community that's in everybody's best interest that you start looking at a decentralized Oracle feed for your decentralized apps for the very reason you just pointed out, Breed, like it's that um, the, the ability to trust but verify and to, the fact that um, if you're using a protocol, you can say, okay, well, if there is, it, it's really in the, for the protection of right of protocols and dApps themselves to create more trust within their own communities to say, you know, our, our yes, our protocol is decentralized and sitting on a smart contract, but it's dependent on the data feed that we run ourselves. Trust us, it's fine. You, you know, we need to get beyond that as, as another stage in the maturity of like decentralizing our space as a whole. So it's, you know, to the, the, these kind of feeds were not available yet. The Cardano, you know, the oracles are, have emerged in other kinds of L1s as well, maybe a little bit slower on our, in our space than others, but now they're here. And we're here and we're very uh, eager to move ahead really quickly and start deploying as many other feeds as we can. And so we, the, another big step for us now is simply educating the community on the need for um, users of protocols to start uh, asking questions in their communities about whether they are using decentralized Oracle feeds or not. And if so, is that a good use case for them or not? Um, we just now need to start that conversation about why 
why we need decentralized oracles uh, and why it's a good thing for Cardano as a whole. Because it will, as I hopefully by my explanation earlier, you'll understand that it only raised the credibility and trustworthiness of, of DeFi on Cardano if we can demonstrate also that we have these very trustworthy data feeds going into our trustless blockchain. Wonderfully said. I do want to follow up with two brief questions before we move along into the next topic, which is going to be just the developmental phase and your approach to becoming more or fully decentralized. First question, on top of the ADA USD feed, which is free, you know, what else has been requested or what are you guys thinking about putting out in terms of data, you know, again, from either point in terms of what you see the community needs or what the community has been asking for. And then the second question was going to be surrounding the pricing. So you mentioned that ADA USD is free, but what do you plan on doing for other feeds and how do you plan on charging them for that? So again, I'll let you answer both of those and then we're going to move things along. Great. Yeah. So the, the very next feeds that we know we're going to add next is going to be ADA to Bitcoin and ADA to Euros. So those, those will be offered and they will also be subsidized feeds. And the reason we're subsidizing the feeds is we want developers to start using them, have, have a long enough on-ramp for them to be comfortable testing and integrating it without the additional burden of worrying about paying for the feeds at this early stage. So it's really about creating network effect as well, trying to get as many developers um, using our platform, getting them hooked into the Cardano Open Oracle protocol, hopefully see the benefits of using that particular protocol for their OrcFax, the Oracle feeds. And um, so those, yeah, BTC and Euros are, are next. And then we're starting to see a lot of interest in stablecoin type uh, tracking um, outside of Cardano stablecoin, like USDT and USDC, for example. Um, there's some products out there that use those. And um, we're also seeing like a, like the, the sports uh, results scenarios, one that's very interesting. We have some discussions. The other use case I didn't really mention earlier was like supply chain tracking. Um, so, you know, when products, you know, are, are, are harvested, let's say, brought into the factory, turned into products, moved into delivery uh, uh, supply chains, um, Oracles can provide a really interesting use case around that. So we're, we're having some discussions around that. But we expect the most highest demand and our most of our attention will go next will be to Cardano native tokens uh, within the Cardano space itself. There's a variety of different ways you can kind of get at the, the actual price uh, for Cardano native tokens. And we have, uh, again, applied our triangulation policy to this and using essentially like full Cardano nodes to read Cardano blockchain per transactions and arrive at um, uh, very realistic empirical Cardano native token prices. So we're very interested to start working on that product. And um, that will then depend on, a, uh, you know, which we have a different formula for figuring out perhaps having an index of top CNTs. Uh, there's actual CNT protocols themselves that want the tracking of their own coin for their own communities as well. So again, we see most of the work being around, um, around you know, currency price pairs. That's the thing we're most comfortable and, and knowledgeable with as far as like data input feeds, Oracle feeds in the DeFi space. But we also hope, we're also very, encouraged by people knocking on our door, wanting to try new products that don't exist yet because they don't have an Oracle feed yet. So we're like, hey, we're listening. What do you guys want to do? And then, um, yeah, to your point, um, it's like at the end of the day, all this has to pay for itself somehow. We're very fortunate that we've for currently had a very successful ISPO um, earlier in the year, and we just finished a fairly successful token launch, meaning that as a technical team, we have some on-ramp for, for the remaining year to actually put our head down and deliver on these things. Um, the actual tokenomics, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, is uh, 50% of our fixed token supply is reserved for valid validator rewards to subsidize and incentivize people to participate in the validator network. Um, but at some point, then the system has to become self-sustainable, meaning it should be able to pay for itself. So this is where we will be introducing this year as well, our on-demand model. So if you remember earlier, I said for the price feed, we will publish at a one-hour heartbeat, unless there's a one percent price deviation, let's say there's a big spike, there's something, some dramatic event happens. And suddenly within that one hour period, there's a lot of buying and selling and happening in ADA. So if there's a 1% deviation in that price, we will publish within the hour as well before the next hour is up. But then you can, there's also going to be scenarios where we're now we're going to have DeFi protocols that don't want to wait for an hour. They want this data right now, or whether it's price data or something else. And so they will come to us for on-demand publication. And so that's when you will pay using the FAP utility token. This is one of the, the utilities of the FAP token is for um, DAP and smart contract um, protocols to come to us and say, we would like to pay for this OrcFax data feed right now. We want to see it in the next block. We don't want to wait this long. 
And so that they will pay them pay a fee per per data fee type. The, and there's going to be quite a wide variation in the cost of publishing data. Again, some data is very cheap to source. Some is going to be more expensive to source. And that will then be reflected in the Oracle data feed price. And that should then hopefully work out in some kind of business model for the downstream app that everybody can still make money in the end. So what we will be doing over the next year while we get people using our free price feeds and also start working on an incentivized test net is figuring out that business model as well. Like getting better uh, statistics around the actual cost to produce data. There's obviously a total cost versus, you know, you can, you can do things like breakdown server costs and API fees and that kind of thing. But at the end of the day, there's a kind of a total network cost. And those kind of figures we want to work out to really tweak our economic model to make sure that the entire system will become self-sustaining at some point. Now, the reason that a project might, uh, the other reason a project might want to use our on-demand feature is that they will be offered the actual OrcFax, the OrcFax Oracle datum, signed the signed certified transaction datum that they can include themselves in the next block with their own transaction. So they might have a smart contract then that gets access to authentic certified Oracle data one block before any other DAP or smart contract might get that. And you can imagine there might be some kind of business advantage to that. The cool thing about our model is that it's a pay, pay it forward kind of model so that as long as at least one person does that pays for that on-demand feed, they use it in one block. The next block, it becomes available for free. Everybody downstream as a reference input. And this is one of the beautiful things we got with the Vassal hard fork is the ability for multiple um, uh, multiple apps to read the same uh, EU FXO at the same time using the reference input model. And, and again, that's there's no charge after that. That's available for free. So we anticipate moving to this on-demand model, especially when we start seeing requests for more boutique kind of data feeds. We can charge more for those kind of data feeds. And then we... After giving ourselves a very long on-ramp with the, the validator uh, token subsidies, um, transition to some point with, it, with, the, with the network, we've given ourselves at least three years for this, for this model to kick in. With the network itself, the fees themselves start paying for the network. And at that point, we'll also start looking at transitioning to a DAO where we can finally step back and have the system itself being fully self-sustaining, 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 self-supporting, self-reporting self-maintaining and and switch completely to a decentralized autonomous organization for the governance of the network which will then start making decisions like should we hire these contractors to do the next release should we um you know should we pay so and so to monitor the network should we should we add this data feed should we retire this data feed those are all become dao based governance decisions for running the network once we get it up and running and off the ground in this uh this on ramp phase thank you for the answers on both of those questions. Again, just some of the things that I picked up, um, some of the highlights, the data on demand, I think is is fair. It makes sense, especially in an environment where there are so many different applications for the data. It's really hard to say, hey, we're going to have one particular price for everything because everybody needs the data at a different rate or at a different time and just at um, for different use cases. So that makes sense. You also touched on the pay it forward, which I think is really awesome to hear that you're able to leverage some of these new enhancements that were deployed to Cardano that not just benefit whoever is able to uh, make that initial payment to get the data up front, but then to basically have that then be passed on or propagated to everybody else that comes in behind them. I think that's what we need more of in the spaces. People not necessarily taking and hoarding the data for themselves, but saying, hey, we might have paid for it early on, but here's everybody else and you guys can also go ahead and leverage it. I think that almost creates like this flywheel where, for example, if you're getting a coffee somewhere and somebody pays it forward, the next person that get, got it paid for them is more reluctant mm -hmm. or is more willing to also do the same thing. And then that also makes the third person behind everybody else also just continue to, to keep on doing the same thing. Hopefully that made sense. I think it, it it's, yeah. it's a great boost for morale. Thank you. Yeah, that's uh, and again, it, you mentioned open source earlier, and I, I should, you know, I, I myself in the in the archive space have been an open source developer for over fifteen years now. I, I developed the two most widely used archival platforms in in the archive space. It's used around the world at a variety of or, um, archives and museums and libraries, galleries, state organizations, or archives, and so forth. And um, so I come from this. I, the reason I'm saying that is that I come from this world where we we very much have to do as uh, stretch our dollar as much as we can in the archives world. It's like it's the public sector. 
it's um, pe people have to pay. To, it's an expense to keep archives online. It's like who's paying those bills? It's not it's not something that generates a lot of money. So uh, we we used open source as a strategy in that in that sector for a number of years to take to stretch our dollar as far as we can. If somebody's willing to pay for an enhancement to the platform, great. And then we'll put it in the next release, and everybody gets to use it afterwards. And that that creates a community and interest around it, where more people will invest their time and resources and put money in the pot to create the next version or the next release. And that's the type of mentality that me and my team have worked in the last few years already. And that's what we're trying to bring to this space as well. And that's that's part of that mindset of like, how can we stretch what little we have as, as far as possible? And which at the end of the day should make this sustainable and, and, and cost uh, cost effective. You, and so and, and, and then so to go back, just I just want to also want to give a shout out to Pi Cardano and Option and those developers, because that's another great example of how we're benefiting from somebody else contributing to the community. Right. And it's just we're all standing on the shoulders of the giants. We're all just helping each other out and building this infrastructure together. And that really is the beauty in, in the open source model. And again, that's something I'm very encouraged to see a very strong open source um, uh, uh, like uh, like passion in the, in the Cardano community. And like there's a, there's a strong component within the, the developer builder community that, that that thinks that way and wants to wants to work in an open source way. And I, again, it's, it's to the benefit of us all and, and, you know, a rising tide raises all boats. Right. So that's what I, that's a big part of what we're trying to do. Yeah, you you literally took the words out of my mind and <laughs> you, you spelled them out. That That was the point that I was trying to make. Now, in closing, you did touch on your very successful ISPO. I do recall covering that a couple of months back, and I was highly impressed by how quickly your pool became basically fully saturated. It was in a matter of just a couple of epochs, and I just remember covering that. And then more recently, the FACT token launch using the WRLP or the Wingwriters launch pad, which that also had a huge amount of demand for. And so let's just kind of keep things moving along here. I do want to respect your time, Peter. Again, thank you for joining me as a part of today's video. You kind of touched on this a little bit, but are there any potential integrations or partnerships on the horizon? For example, you mentioned um, collaborating or utilizing Arweave. I know that we've got a data storage platform building on Cardano called Iagon. You know, mm -hmm. could we potentially see a partnership with that? We've also got a betting platform coming online called Forion. You know, are there any Cardano native projects that are somewhat in the talks with you guys in terms of initial integrations? Yeah, um, I got it slightly different. Is like we might, we are definitely interested in offering uh, an IPFS Filecoin based storage solution alternative to Arweave. And that's where that would fit in. Forion is definitely one of those protocols that would be very interesting for us to talk to. And we have had some prelim preliminary discussions along with several others. That's just not to say that anything's happening, but um, certainly we're very interested in talking to projects like Forion. The one that's actually you know, probably most public up until now is our we've had lots of close discussions with the Indigo team over the last few months as far as with their technical team, as far as like figuring out, um, again, getting some feedback on the Cardano Open Protocol, how they would use it in the Indigo Protocol. We just completed a very detailed technical architecture analysis that they want to present to their DAO shortly and, and bring it to a vote on whether or not to start moving and including Orcfax Oracle feeds as something in their protocol. That That's all something that they, in, in their very cool decentralized governance uh, structure, bring to their own DAO first. And so, uh, yeah, we have a number of technical questions to work through with them still, but that is, you know, for us, we hope that's could be hopefully one of the more high profile integrations that we're able to get off the ground in the, in the near future. All the rest, unfortunately, right now are still a bit behind closed doors, um, but our business development team is very busy taking calls, um, taking messages every week and having calls and um, really trying to figure out where our market is and where the demand is. Yeah, I think as you guys grow, inevitably more projects come into the ecosystem and the, the need for this data doesn't go away, right? It's something that is always going to be there. So I think that as time goes on, you guys will be able to make a name here within your uh, within the current ecosystem. And it'll be interesting to see if you guys do end up potentially br branching out. I guess maybe that's another question. You know, you guys are a Cardano native project right now, you know, do you guys have thoughts about potentially going multi-chain, especially as you guys get more adoption? Um, our, our, the Cardano Open Oracle Protocol and the EU XO model are so specific that it's very hard. It's a big leap to jump and, and move, start publishing to another type of uh, blockchain technology, and that's perhaps why we haven't seen much competition in Oracle space yet in Cardano, is because it's it's not that easy to like figure out how to do an Oracle on, on Cardano. To be honest with you, we figured it out, and Charlie guys have figured it out as well. Um, but uh, we very much. We've chosen a Cardano blockchain for to build an oracle on, not just because we feel like it needs an oracle, but we also want it the, we also want to take the benefit of the Cardano technology ourselves. We believe it's really a solid anchor. I, I truly believe it's the sleeping giant of L1s in this current um, current bull uh, sorry bear market, 
and that when we when we finally turn the corner with the bull market for crypto as a whole, I, I really think Cardano is going to impress a lot of people, and we want to be in the middle of that. I think Cardano DeFi is going to be hot at that point, and definitely the need for oracles and oracle feeds is going to be really important to that to that puzzle. So going, we, we really see ourselves as a Cardano native uh, solution for for a long time coming. It's maybe when we go out to this idea of going out to the the rest of the world, going, hey, we've got something really interesting here. We've got this way of like verifying facts and about the real world, and we got we were, we were able to like validate it and verify it on this really great trustless blockchain. Well, don't you want to use this for this fact checking service or something else? That's maybe when we become more outward looking. But quite honestly, for the next two or three years, we're going to be very focused on servicing just purely the Cardano community. There's going to be more than enough demand for that in, in business space alone. Happy to hear it. You guys are here for the long term. Now, let's keep things moving right along. One thing that we touched on earlier was going to be the org facts token or the fact token and the token utility. You did touch on the reward payments to validators, but do you mind just quickly giving us a brief overview of these four points and how this plays into the fact token, as well as just a brief overview of the tokenomics and why things are broken down as they are? You bet. So yeah, over the course of this call, I um, I mentioned all four of these at some point, but this is really the, 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 the reason for us having a token is that it provides this utility in our network. First and foremost, for a, a way to pay for um, uh, Oracle data publication. So um, again, if the, you, you want to take advantage of the on-demand model, this is the token you will use to, to make payment. The uh, we will have a conversion service as well, so that at some point, if, you know, if you're not a regular user of the platform, it might be to your advantage to pay an ADA and then have us swap it out for Fact Token to pay for it. But certainly, there's going to be some protocols and platforms that are going to be high, high, uh, have high use of the platform, and it's going to be in their best interest to hold the Fact Token to save costs for the publication fees. And then the really other critical piece of the puzzle is, is our uh, mentioned earlier, is our, is our decentralized data validator network where we will uh, have uh, data validator node operators similar to SBOs doing the data, running these servers that are doing the data collection and validation and um, random publication onto the, onto the blockchain um, as independent validator pool operators, uh, the pool, uh, node pool operators. And to incentivize them, uh, we, they will be paid in, in fact token as rewards. And then for them to have some skin in the game, as, as you expect out of any validator node network, you expect a mistake in a particular token. In this case, that's the, the other role, the fact token. And then once we manage to uh, launch the network, get it to the point where it's self-sustaining, we will make this transition to uh, decentralized governance for uh, the OrgFax network. And then the governance decisions there, we expect to be stake-based. It'll be very much in parallel with the kind of Voltaire kind of discussions that are happening. We'll very much follow the lead of the Canada community on establishing good DAO governance. I think that whole, all of that work is still very early days in my opinion. And this all this kind of social engineering stuff that's very hard to solve that uh, we will gladly tap into the expertise of the Cardano community. But so we expect our DAO to, but we I do expect that to be some kind of stake-based uh, governance like we're seeing across the uh, Cardano ecosystem now. And that's again, that the final role that the, the fact token will have is, is to provide um, stake in, in that, vote, in that vote, voting mechanism. Um, we may see other utility over time. We have talked about some others, but we expect these four to be the most stable re reasons for for using uh, Orgfax token. And then, if you want to switch to the tokenomics chart, like that, that that's um, you know, say what you will for any um, decentralized Web three project. The the reason the token may or may not have value, the open market makes that decision for you. Um, you you we minted a fixed supply of uh, Fact token, one billion. And um, as you can see from the pie chart, uh, we really, this is both symbolic and intentional, is to like, it really indicate that we have a serious commitment to getting a network effect for our platform um, by committing half the token supply to rewarding validators for doing that data collection and validation publishing for us and giving us a nice long on-ramp um, to give us that, that ability to launch the network and get it to a self-sustaining point. And then um, other parts of the pie chart are probably fairly familiar to most people. So we had we did have the 10% for the ISPO. We had 11% that we dedicated to the Wing Riders Launchpad, where we used their decentralized launchpad to arrive at decentralized price discovery for the initial launch of the token. We're reserving 1% for promotional airdrops. So we're, we're going to have a, a quest campaign shortly. There's other kind of giveaways that we're saving that for. Um, the yield farming API is again to like encourage people to provide liquidity for the fact pools that we have open on, on MinSwap and Wingriders right now. So we're providing very generous um, yield farming rewards at the moment. 
Um, ecosystem is reserved for partnerships um, and uh, other kinds of ways of building uh, our, out our, our ecosystem itself, the ArcFax ecosystem. So that's developers, users, and so forth. Um, the foundation allocation will be for the, the DAO. So that will go, that will be for the DAO treasury and for funding the DAO activities once that's launched. And then uh, team and advisors is the last remaining share of the, the sweat equity that went into launching the Orfax network um, is going to the team. Um, so yeah, I, th I think other than that big 50%, I think other than those, those allocations, I think are very, uh, fairly standard otherwise, uh, but I'm happy to answer your questions around them. Yeah, no, I was going to say, I agree. And the biggest thing that did stick out to me was the 50%, which I think, as you mentioned, is a testament to your commitment to node validators or data validators that are basically going to be the backbone of the OrcFax protocol. So let's keep things rolling right along, Peter. The next thing I want to jump into is going to be kind of switching gears back over into the mainnet launch and how that was the first phase of where you guys potentially see this protocol going. Now, looking here at your developmental roadmap, there's two additional phases, and it looks like as the additional phases roll out, you guys are going to be getting more and more decentralized. Do you mind touching on where we are right now, what portions of the protocol will be improved and more decentralized as we go along in phase two and phase three? Yeah, you bet. Thanks. So we're only at that very first um, interval right now. You can see October 23rd at the bottom left-hand corner there. So we just launched phase one, and that's the, the ADA USD feed that we were talking about today. And then very shortly, we'll see the uh, the BTC and Euro feeds added to that as well. And we're calling that the federated mainnet feeds phase in the sense that federated meaning that we, OrgFax, the project itself, is running the collector and validator nodes during this phase. And so we have a minimum of five collector nodes spread out in three around three continents around the world. Um, occurring a minimum of three um, centralized exchange APIs for the price feed data. And that's that similar model like where OrgFax itself runs the collector and validator nodes for the, the additional feeds that we'll be adding over the next uh, and we'll be keeping up free and subsidized over that 12 month period. So that first green bar you see phase one, that's running for 12 months then that we, will, we basically say these, any feeds that we put up from the mainnet for that time period um, will be subsidized and paid for for that period of time until uh, uh, that phase three at the bottom where we transition to this decentralized um, validated pool network model. And in between there, we've got this phase two where we're really testing the technology and also the economic incentives around the validated pool network. So we're gonna have a, a variety of releases and phases for the actual validator node technology itself. There's you know, obviously a number of things we need to work out from security and reliability perspective. Also just from a community management perspective, like what's the right numbers to use for uh, a minimum stake and rewards and so forth. So that's all gonna play out over a course of six months of an incentivized test net. It's incentivized in that by the time it's done, if you participated and you will be, you will be getting test fact all along, that, that test fact will be, you will be rewarded in actual fact when, it's, when the test net's over. So you'll be rewarded for helping us do this R&D and getting this technology to the next phase. And after that phase, um, by the end of uh, uh, this coming May, um, we then expect to use that that knowledge to actually then switch the mainnet feeds over, and we'll be running it two in parallel for a while, just as a just as a robustness mechanism, as a backup. Um, but at that point, then phase three is when all the data will now be collected by decentralized validator nodes, and no longer in the incentivized testnet is being published to the prepod testnet. In phase three, it is now decentralized validator nodes and is publishing to mainnet. So that's the two coming together in phase three. And then from that point on, um, it's the, the next major hurdle and step is getting, you know, adding more fees and so forth, but then transitioning the governance of the entire network over to a DAO. And that's that's obviously, a, like I said, a long-term project. We, we consider like maybe a three-year window for that roadmap. Um, and then a lot of uh, interesting data feed work to do along the way. Very happy to hear. So it sounds like right now you guys have at least gotten your feet off the ground. As a part of phase two, that's when the community can chip in as a part of the incentivized right. testnet. And where we're really yeah. looking to get to is going to be at phase three where things are fully decentralized. The community has a say in the direction of the protocol and the data being brought on chain is uh, managed in a trustless and decentralized way. As you mentioned earlier, is one of the biggest things that we need right now in not just the Cardano space, but just in the blockchain Oracle community as a whole. So very happy to hear that. Now, Peter, we've been going for about 48 minutes. Again, I wanna thank you so much for your time. I always like to end these interviews by just talking to the founders and seeing what their long-term vision is. So I'm going to pose you the same exact question. And even after just chatting, I personally feel like an expert when it comes to OrgFax, but I want to get your take as to where you see OrgFax in the near future. And then is there any last things or closing thoughts that you want to share with the community that you have not had the chance to highlight so far? 
Yeah, well, I mean, and the number one goal and mission is simply to provide, like, or like I said, a really trustworthy decentralized Oracle feed service for Cardano to to fulfill the promise of decentralization decentralization technology on what I, again I I believe is the best engineered and most reliable and stable blockchain L1 going forward. So that's our number one mission: is like let's not lose the plot. Let's um, the mission of decentralization um, needs um, decentralized oracles. So that's the you know that's the hole that we're plugging. Um, but again, as I've hinted at during this call, I think there's there's going to be secondary function, downstream function for Oracle networks as a whole. This I, this if once we have this mechanism in place that provides us with like a, a fact validation, a truth verification, a data collection service uh, of the magnitude we haven't seen before, with the kinds of like veracity guarantees we've never seen before because we've never seen it backed by uh, trustless blockchain technology, civil resistant uh, network technology, and so. Um, at some point, I believe that, and the vision I see for something like Orgfax is goes goes beyond just providing DeFi uh, price feeds, like I mentioned earlier, to some kind of like fact checking service that can service society as a whole. And the really exciting thing about Orgfax and the, the way that we're archiving this data is we're using highly open, reusable standards to package these audit logs, meaning that um, even outside blockchain now, we're creating essentially a data lake of like verified fact statements that can be repurposed and reused and can in fact be used for AI trading is one of the interesting things we're looking at. Um, because we are formatting all our data in, in linked data resource RDF format, making it highly machine readable and perfectly right for doing things like AI model training. So this I this this whole everything that's ever going to the org facts. Uh, system and all the data feeds we're going to start adding is going to start adding to this giant decentralized permission permissionless data lake of verified highly reusable fact statements and so you know the sky's the limit once we get there i think this is going to be a really interesting um place for org facts to move into long term and that's that's the best we got for vision right now because there don't get me wrong there's lots of day-to-day -day, um uh still engineering tasks that we're having to solve to get this network up and running to the point where we're really getting to that phase three that we just talked about yeah, I'm super excited and even more so after having this nice chat with you. Um, again, I want to thank you so much, Peter, for your time. And I just want to close out here by shouting out um, your biggest resource, probably for anybody who's looking to get in touch with the community, which is going to be your official website. So for anybody who's looking to find out more about what OrcFax is bringing, again, they're going to be a decentralized Oracle platform building on Cardano. You can head over to their official website, which is available at orcfax.io. But that's going to bring us here to the end for today today's in-depth interview surrounding the OrcFax protocol and overview of the platform, their recent mainnet launch, potential partnerships, and just their developmental roadmap over the course of the last couple of months, and then where they're going to be heading into the near future. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you all for sticking along throughout this ride. Peter, I want to thank you as well. Again, if you guys want to find out more about them, check the links down below as a part of today's video description. As we close out for the viewers, if you guys found any portion of today's video to be helpful, um, again, thanks to Peter. I would appreciate you guys if you guys could tap that like button. If it's your first time stopping by DAP Central and you guys want more content like this surrounding the top builders in the Cardano ecosystem, consider subscribing. And last but not least, if you guys have any questions for myself or Peter surrounding the OrcFax protocol, then make sure to go ahead and leave them down below in the comments comment section that said and as always we'll see you guys in the next video